state your name and your current address. William S. McMillan, more commonly known as Stan, 17 Highland Place, Kanjahari, New York, 13317. And what year did you join the U.S. Navy? 1942. Did you enlist or were you drafted? No, I enlisted. Were you in the regular Navy or the reserve? Uh, reserves. How long did you serve and during what period? Three years uh, during World War II. When you enlisted, how old were you? Eighteen. Where were you living when you enlisted? Rochester, New York. Did you have any prior experiences at sea? No. What family did you leave when you left home for the Navy? Uh, mother and father and two brothers. What were your feelings about leaving? Well, it was the thing to do, I guess, in those days. And uh, although my family would just as soon have held on to me, I, I felt that I just had to go. Prior to enlisting, what did you do in civilian life? Well, I just finished high school in 1942 in June. And uh, so I really wasn't in the job market very long before I was in the Navy. Were you a Boy Scout? Yes, I was. Did any aspect of scouting help you prepare for your Navy experiences? Well, not that I can recall. Uh, it was a good scouting experience, but I, to relate the two is a little difficult. When you joined the Navy, what were your first experiences? Well, I got sent to boot camp uh, near Geneva, New York. I can't think of the name of the camp right now. but. Uh, that wasn't a very pleasant time. Uh, boot camp was really pretty nasty, rough. Um, I was pretty glad to be finished with it. That was the first experience, I guess, that, that I had in the Navy. Where did you go after boot camp? Well, they picked me out and sent me to uh, Fleet Sonar School in Key West, Florida. And the basis for this was that uh, Ever since I'd been about in the fourth grade, I've been intensely interested in music, and I'd played several instruments, and I was a member of a, a high school dance band as well as the uh, symphonic bands and orchestras and so on. So uh, being a little naive, when they asked me what I'd like to be and they showed me a whole bunch of possibilities, I thought I'd like to be a musician. But at that particular time, the Navy wasn't interested in music, and so uh, they put me into sonar, which was... Uh, supposed to be um, good for people that had a good, strong musical ear. And I wound up going to the Fleet Sonar School in Key West as a result. What was the destroyer escort or escort's name which you served on? Well, the first one I served on uh, was the USS Bull, which was DE-693. And the second one was the USS Bates, DE-68. How long did you serve on these ships? Oh... Evans, probably about about a year and a half total, I guess, pretty evenly divided between them. That's that's a rough guess. What was your first experience with the destroyer escort? Uh, well, we were we were, I was uh, after I graduated from the fleet sonar school. Um, they sent me to the uh, receiving station at Norfolk, Virginia, for assignment and. In a few days, I was assigned to the crew of the USS Bull, and they put us on a troop train, sent us across uh, through southern states, Georgia and Alabama and all, and we wound up in New Orleans, and uh, we met our ship there. The uh, USS Bull had been built in Bay City, Michigan, floated down the Mississippi River, and the crew got on board at New Orleans and commissioned the ship, and so I'm, a, in a sense, I'm a plank owner for that ship. Um, we'll go from there, I guess. Did the ship appear large or small? It didn't appear terribly large to me because I had been used to seeing uh, large ships on the Great Lakes. Uh, my home was Rochester, and I used to cross Lake Ontario quite often on car ferries, which were probably equally as long or and certainly much bigger than the uh, destroyer escort. So the destroyer escort looked a bit small. What was your first at-sea experience? First at-sea? Well, we um, 
We sailed out of New Orleans eventually and went directly to Bermuda for a shakedown. And uh, every day we would go out and test the guns and the torpedoes and uh, how fast we could get to battle stations and uh, fire control and everything else under the sun. Submarine attacks, these were all practice sessions, training sessions. And we were probably a month at uh, Bermuda uh, before all of that was completed. Did everything work as pl planned on the shakedown? Well, uh, eventually I guess it did, although uh, in the very beginning our skipper was none too pleased with the way things were going and he let us know in no uncertain terms that things had to improve. Uh, which they did. Where did the ship go next? We uh, we went up to uh, Boston and took a convoy to uh, all the Dutch Antilles, uh, Curacao and Aruba. We went to uh, Curacao and uh, we were transporting tankers there and uh, that was our first real major job, I guess. What theaters of duty did the ship sail? Theaters? Well, while I was aboard, it was only in the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, we crossed the Atlantic a number of different times to Britain uh, with convoys. What battle campaigns did the ship participate in when you were on, the, on board? Uh, during the time I was on board the Bull, uh, there weren't any battle campaigns at all. We we were on a uh, New York to London Dairy Ireland run for quite a while, and uh, the ship didn't encounter any hostile forces. We just took convoys back and forth. Later, I was transferred to the USS Bates, and the Bates uh, was on the same division, making the same London to London Dairy to New York uh, convoys. Uh, after, I don't know how many convoys, they detached the baits, and this was in June of 1944, and we were sent along with the rich to uh, Plymouth, England, where everything was getting ready for the invasion of France, and uh, from there on I was on the, the baits, which went into Normandy, and then did some more convoy duty later. Can you give us a rough idea of other places you sailed and the times involved? Well, we were, as I say, we were in the Boston area. We we towed targets uh, for a couple of weeks in uh, Massachusetts Bay. Um, we we made the one trip to the Caribbean. Uh, the rest of the trips were all across the North Atlantic. I think I sailed across the North Atlantic 14 times altogether, which is about 12 times too many. When you first boarded the ship, what was your rating and rate? I was a sonar man third class by this time. I had gotten uh, promoted when I graduated from the sonar school. How did you learn about the shipboard routine? How did I learn about the shipboard routine? Well, I guess uh, I was as green as anybody and probably I just had to go along with uh, the routine that was imposed by the skipper or by the uh, chief petty officers and so on. I just fell in line, did what was expected, I guess. Did you spend any time as a mess cook? No. Did you, did you advance to a higher rate? Oh yeah, before I was finished I wound up being first class petty officer. By what means? Well, uh, I had to take examinations. They uh, limited you to advancement uh, from one rate for a certain time period, and once the time period had expired, uh, you could go on and take the examinations for the next highest rating, uh, and I did this as rapidly as uh, the time periods would elapse. I was up for the next rate, so I had gotten up to be first class uh, petty officer by the time I finished. What shipboard equipment did you operate? Uh, Anti-submarine warfare, uh, um, listening gear, uh, all kinds of uh, range finders and, um, you know, instruments uh, involved with uh, 
seeking out and destroying enemy submarines. Was there anything notable about the equipment? Well, having just recently been on a more modern destroyer, I think by today's standards our equipment was pretty primitive, but I think at the time um, it was very impressive to learn how this whole concept of uh, sound ranging really worked when you send out a signal and and rely on the signal to bounce back at you from an object that, that might uh, be intercepted by the signal. It, it's really quite a, a novel idea. The British had started it, um, but they had not uh, perfected the system. I think the American Navy came along and uh, in, improved greatly on what the British had started. And so it was, uh, it was a sort of standard method for seeking out German submarines at least and probably Japanese ones too. Did it always work? Well, I'm not sure if it always worked. Uh, I think uh, probably you'd have to say that it did because in the end the German submarines suffered something like 75 percent casualties and uh, so I have to think something was working right. I didn't happen to be in on the kill in any of these occasions but uh, I know that there are enough uh, documented incidents where ships would hunt down a submarine and uh, the submarine was pretty well uh, hopeless against the attack. But of course the submarines had earlier on had had their own way and now this was just sort of turning the, the tide on them a bit. Was it easy to operate? Yeah, after you had been properly instructed, uh, you know, on you know the method uh, the method for uh, using the equipment and all yes it was it was not something that was difficult did the equipment have to be cleaned and maintained uh we didn't have anybody on board the ship who was in that uh, particular capacity if the uh equipment did need some work uh it would have to be taken care of whenever we came into port in american port uh, later on during the war they were starting to train sonar operators. I was a sonar operator. Uh, they were starting to train us to become technicians so that we could repair the equipment. And they took me off the baits oh, probably in um, September of 1944 and they sent me back to school to learn how to become a technician and before I could finished the course the war ended so I never actually got as far as uh, that particular phase. Besides operating the equipment, would your rate also involve in the, in the performance of other certain duties? Mm, not necessarily uh, unless you know there were unusual situations that occurred for instance uh, if the sonar equipment had to be shut down for any reason, uh, we were assigned to do other things, uh, notably as lookouts, uh, sometimes also as helmsmen. Uh, but normally our duties didn't go beyond uh, the anti-submarine business. What watches and watch sections did you routinely, routinely stand? Well, we were four on and eight off. And uh, this would change each week so that uh, you might be working uh, 12 to 4 uh, in the, in the uh, small hours of the morning and then in the afternoon. The next week you might be working 4 to 8 and the following week 8 to 12. So you did rotate your hours a lot. What were your specific duties during the watch? Well, there were two sonar men on duty in the uh, conning tower of the uh, destroyer escort and we would operate the sound ranging equipment for 15 minutes apiece and then change places uh, in order to, to make sure that everybody could stay alert and that uh, the monotony of the uh, sounding equipment didn't uh, drug you to sleep or something like that uh, so you'd take turns with it but in the event that uh, you should ever have a contact with the enemy, whoever was not actually doing the sound listening 
had other duties to perform with sound ranging equipment and so on, so that you were sort of like a standby. If you're not actually operating, you were being the standby all the while. Did you favor one watch over another? Well, yeah, I think probably, I think, uh, I think the best one was probably 8 to 12 because you could get up after breakfast and serve your first one, and then in the evening you'd be off at midnight and could get a good night's sleep. Some of the others uh, made it pretty tough to, to sleep and uh, live a normal uh, sort of life. What hardships did you encounter while standing watch? Well, I can't think of any particular hardships other than uh, some very stormy nights when the ship would be pitching and uh, screwing all over the place, but it really didn't make much difference whether you're on watch or, or uh, trying to sleep. It was all the same. Uh, as a matter of fact, you might better be on watch during that kind of weather because at least uh, you weren't wasting your time <laughs> if you're trying to sleep in the, and you're getting thrown out of your bunk all the time. That didn't help much either. Did you do the same basic duties during general quarters, or did your duties change? No, same duties. We were uh, our battle station was in the sound, the sound room. How long would you remain at general quarters? Well, the uh, custom on convoy duty in those days was to go on general quarters at about four o'clock in the morning when it was still quite dark, and stay on general quarters until probably a half an hour or maybe three quarters of an hour after the, the uh, light had come because the ships were always uh, at more risk uh, in, in those particular hours because of the silhouettes that could be seen by the enemy. Uh, the same thing would be true as sunset would be coming, that, that they would have us uh, at general quarters for probably an hour and a half or so while, while the uh, sun was either coming up or going down. Did you perform general quarters drills often? Oh, quite often, yeah. They used to have that constantly. How long would it take you to man general quarters? Oh, my. Well, the, you know, the entire ship, as I recall, would be fully at quarters within something like two and a half minutes uh, under the worst conditions. Uh, you slept with your clothes on most of the time, and if the alarm went, you were off and running, and uh, it didn't take all that long to get to your station. Did the, did the time improve the more you jailed? Well, I think we got to a certain point, and you just couldn't really very much improve on that very much. Uh, when we started off, of course, we were quite slow, uh, but the more we went at it, the better it got. I think after a while, you know, you just get to a point where you can't really improve that much more on it. During the drills, did everything always go as planned? Well, generally, I think so. I'm not sure what exactly what you mean by that, but I think that, as far as I can tell, everything went pretty well as planned. What special sea details were you involved with? Well, I wasn't involved in any sea detail at all. You're talking, I think, now about uh, uh, entering or leaving port. Yeah, no, I had no particular duties, except uh, as we would secure the sonar gear coming into a harbor situation, we'd very often have to go on a helm uh, watch. And I can remember coming into New York Harbor one time, and I was the uh, helmsman because the sonar gear had been secured for the, for the rest of the trip. But generally, uh, we didn't have any sea duties. Did you have an active role during underway refueling and re replenishment details? No. Wong Destroyer Escorts, who were your COs? Oh boy, that's good be hard to answer now, 50 years later. Uh, I remember one of my favorites was a guy named Ferguson. Now, he was on the Bates, and uh, I thought he was very, very efficient. And uh, he ran a real tight ship without being uh, kind of a person that you'd like to kill, you know. 
he was really a nice guy, and yet at the same time uh, the ship ran well because he insisted on everything being right up to snuff. He was a good captain. Do you ever have any first-hand experiences in officer's country? No. What was your overall impression of the quality of other officers? Of the um, commissioned officers? Uh, the division officers. Oh, okay, commissioned officers. Well, some some were really pretty good, and uh, and there were some others that uh, really were I thought were quite lacking. Um, I was just out of high school and had had no opportunity to become an officer, so uh, I think maybe some of this might have been a little jealousy too. But I, I really thought that some of the people that were uh, assigned to be officers really were not very competent and others were first rate. It's, you'd have to sort them out in, individually. What about the XOs? X executive officers? Oh, the exec. Well, we had very good executive officers, I recall, uh, on both ships. I think the executive officer on uh, one ship was better than the skipper, but uh, that's just an opinion. What about your chiefs or leading pet petty officers? Most of them were pretty good. They were hard-bitten old bunch, and then most of them were regular Navy guys. And... Um, there wasn't any uh, masking the fact that they had a certain disdain for all the reservists because they'd been in the Navy for years maybe and uh, here we all came along and uh, I think uh, the old time chiefs uh, probably resented that to some degree but they were usually very very good they were I think they were all uh, good I'm not sure that I liked the uh, chiefs who were in charge at the boot camp I thought they were a little bit sadistic but uh, the other ones that we had aboard ship were fine. They knew their job, and they did it. And they expected everybody else to know their job and do it, which is fair. Did you have any leadership responsibilities? Not really. Uh, the fact that I was a first-class petty officer was only a tribute to technical skills. I think it was not a. It was not a leadership uh, role. Um, it was a reward for knowing a lot about uh, anti-submarine warfare. Do you have any comment on storms or rough weather? Oh, yeah. Uh, Atlantic Ocean is no place to be. We went through one um, hurricane that was in February, and I think it was just before the invasion, and it was in 44. We came out of Londonderry uh, Harbor and uh, hit the Atlantic and just about turned on and there for the next 15 days trying to get across the Atlantic back to New York. Uh, the uh, waves were absolutely mountainous and the uh, ship was taking such a terrible beating we were really worried that the uh, ocean would um, cause the ship to fall apart at some point. How much did your ship roll? Well, the worst happened uh, to me when I was on a helm watch because the sonar gear had been smashed underneath. The, uh, the head of the sonar gear protrudes from beneath the hull of the ship, and the hull was being taken out of the water and smashed down so much that the sonar gear was smashed and put out of operation. So uh, I was put on a helm watch, and at one night uh, when I was on, the inclinometer went over about to 60 degrees, and I thought we were going to go the rest of the way, but happily we came back again. It was a kind of a frightening uh, affair to know that the ocean could beat you around and you had absolutely no control of anything. I remember the uh, the uh, officer of the deck calling down the pipe that he wanted a full rudder in one direction or another to try to keep us from ramming into the convoy. And uh, I had the rudder over full like he had wanted, and he was screaming, get it over, get it over. And I had to say, it's already over, and we're still going in the opposite direction because the wind and the waves were just sweeping us. We didn't have a collision, of course, because everybody else was having the same trouble. It was a terrible storm. What about everyday activities, like eating and sleeping? Well, we ate and we slept, <laughs> you know. 
I don't think the food was uh, exactly gourmet, but... Uh, during the storm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, during the storms. Ah, yes, excuse me. Yeah, well, the cooks would have to shut down everything probably because they couldn't keep pots and pans on the stoves and uh, you existed on sandwiches and they could make coffee and and uh, keep that going. But uh, uh, usually once the storm was over, you could get back to eating regular meals again. But during the storm, it was pretty tough. Did your ship participate with convoy duty? Say that again? Did your ship participate with convoy duty? I, mean, I still don't quite make out what you said. Go slowly. Did your ship participate with convoy duty? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was our principal job, I guess. How many convoys did your ship participate in? Well, I made 14 trips across the Atlantic, so I guess I went seven convoys over and seven convoys back. It's How long did it, did it take to get there? We were uh, fortunate. We were traveling with what they called fast convoys, and it took us nine days to go across. Some of the slow convoys would take a couple of weeks to get over and back because the convoy had to travel at the speed of the slowest ship. Was the convoy routine monotonous? Not really, no, because there was always... Uh, well, there was always a certain amount of excitement about uh, being out there and uh, knowing, that, you know, in my position at least, knowing w where all the ships were going and uh, what flags they were flying. And we would have uh, ships not only from the United States but from a lot of other countries. And we knew what ports the ships were headed for. And it was kind of an interesting thing. And we were up on the bridge where we could hear a lot of the conversation between the ships. A lot of the conversation between the uh, captain and the executive officer and, you know, plans for where we were going and what we are going to be doing and so on. So it was, it was a little bit exciting, I thought. What is the difference between a fast and a slow convoy? Well, I would have to guess it's probably the makeup of, sh of uh, the merchant ships that are in the group uh, and what they're capable of doing in terms of speed because the convoy still has to travel no faster than the slowest ship in the convoy. But in our case, we saw quite a few tankers and quite a few um, general cargo ships, I guess, that would be carrying, uh, uh, you could see above decks, uh, air craft and tanks and various other kinds of military equipment. Uh, we never actually had a troop ship in our convoy that I can recall, but most of these ships moved along pretty good, so we were able to get across the ocean pretty good time. Most of the time, too, what was a little bit annoying to us was that uh, time after time after time we went into Londonderry, Ireland, which is not a very big place and you can like quickly exhaust whatever there is to see and do in Londonderry, Ireland. And the convoys would be going to places like uh, Glasgow and Liverpool, Plymouth, uh, various British ports. And we kept thinking, wouldn't it be nice to go someplace different and just see what we can see? And uh, each time we would just about get off the Irish coast, the British Navy would, would appear and take charge of the convoy and they would ferry the boats the rest of the way in and, and we'd head right back into Londonderry. Of course there was a big American naval station at Londonderry so it was easy to refuel and to uh, resupply and all the rest. They had an army base there too and I remember that uh, the, army sol the army soldiers uh, used to come to the dock whenever we would be there and presumably other ships too and they would beg to be taken on board and have a meal. Apparently the army meals were not so hot. We didn't think ours were very good, but uh, the army guys seemed to think we were eating pretty well. So they liked to come and chisel a meal whenever they could. What about the time difference between a fast and a slow convoy? Well, I never really sailed in what, what would be called a slow convoy. I guess most of the ones that I was uh, connected with were fairly fast and they would run anywhere from 9 to 11 days for the crossing depending upon the weather more than anything else. 
if you had a, a real rough crossing, it could take a little bit longer to get over. I understand that your ship, the USS Bates, was involved with the rescue of sailors from the USS Rich. Would you care to comment on your personal experiences during the rescue? Uh, well, we weren't exactly involved with rescue from the Rich. Uh, actually, um, I was on the bridge when the Rich struck mines, and I watched the Rich, uh, the rich get uh, hit and watched it sink, but we were a considerable distance from the rich and there wasn't very much that we could do for it. I think there was another uh, ship that went in and uh, got their survivors, but it wasn't ours. However, we did take survivors from the Meredith, which is a destroyer and that had come uh, across the Atlantic as fast as they could get just to get into the invasion at Normandy. And uh, they hit mines before they ever fired a shell, so uh, the entire ship was was lost and never actually did anything. Uh, they didn't have time to. We pulled a lot of the survivors off the Meredith. They were jumping across the uh, fantail of the ship. And uh, then uh, ocean-going tugs got hold of it, and we're going to take it back to England to see if they could salvage it, but they didn't get back as far as England before it went down. I also understand that your ship, the USS Bates, was involved with landings at Normandy. Would you like to, would you care to relate your experiences during this action? Well, we, I mentioned the fact that we were in the convoy duty all this while, and they finally detached us in June and sent us to Belfast, Ireland, which was the first time we'd seen anything besides Londonderry. We were a couple of days at Belfast and having no idea why we were there when we shipped out again and sailed down through the Irish Sea to Plymouth. And we sat in the Plymouth Harbor, uh, sort of, um, I'm trying to think what the word for it is, but anyhow, we couldn't get off the ship. Uh, the only one that was allowed off the ship was the executive officer and the captain who were going to meetings every single day. And all we could do was uh, watch the activity in the harbor, which was pretty intense by this time. There were all kinds of landing craft and, and other ships there. And on the 5th of uh, June, we sailed out of the place and uh, sailed across. And we arrived, we didn't know what was happening until after we left uh, Plymouth, when we were all brought to general quarters and our, com our uh, division officers uh, told us where we were going and uh, what our uh, object was and so on. And it seems that uh, the Bates went in four hours before the invasion started we went in at two o'clock in the morning to two offshore islands uh, called Il San Uh These were very, very small islands, but they had been fortified by Napoleon way, way back. The Air Force had been flying over them for well over a year taking pictures and in all of this time had never ever seen any sign of life but the high command was uh, nervous about them being occupied and didn't want to start the invasion until they cleared out those islands so our job was to go in ahead of the general invasion drop some rangers off and the rangers were going to go ashore and take care of things and then uh, once that was settled the main invasion was able to start uh, there wasn't anybody on the islands. The rangers ran into a lot of trouble with booby traps and mines, and some of them were quite badly injured, and they were brought back aboard our ship with uh, legs missing and arms missing and so on. We had a doctor that had been assigned to us before the uh, invasion trip started, and I know he had his hands full there trying to take care of these guys until we could transfer them to a hospital ship. But when the daylight came, uh, we were the closest ones into the beach, and the German shore batteries spotted us and began to fire at us. I think the Bates was probably the first ship to be fired at by the Germans. The, uh, the Germans, I think, were just getting the range very nicely and probably would have been able to put the next one down our smoke, smokestack, but uh, the fog and mist that had been hanging over the whole ocean was beginning to rise and suddenly you could look out behind us and see something like 5,000 ships out there and the Germans stopped shooting at us at that particular point which is good and they began to uh, you know 
turn their attention to some of the other uh, landing ships and so on. Uh, we we were at uh, Normandy for about seven days, and we did a whole bunch of things uh, during that period of time. They each night they would send us out uh, to the seaward side of all the uh, ships that were anchored there. Um, we saw battleships and cruisers and one thing or another firing constantly at the German shore batteries. But they sent us out to the seaward side to make sure that uh, we wouldn't be infiltrated by e-boats or German submarines. So we ran back and forth in the night hours and we took survivors out of the water, uh, airmen and and we had this one episode with the Meredith that we spoke about a minute ago. Um, that was pretty much it, I guess. Uh, after about a week, things were starting to quiet down pretty well. On the second day of the invasion was when the rich got it. And um, they they were sunk with very, very heavy loss of life. And I'm not really sure how many people were killed right on the spot, but quite a few. I think the number is quite high. What about meals on board the ship? Well, <laughs> it's just a switch to leisure time now. Now the questions will will get. It's leisure time. Well, I don't know. Uh, of course, you um, you know after you've been used to mom's home cooking, the Navy meals are not very exciting. As a matter of fact, some of them are pretty awful. At least in those days, they were. I wasn't very thrilled with the meals. I don't think a lot of other people were either. <laughs> what about the usage of water? Well, we had a, a distilling machine on board that uh, uh, made fresh water for uh, cooking and uh, all that business. And we also were able to take showers quite frequently and wash and so on. The uh, water that went through the toilet areas was all seawater. Uh, and would flush, uh, you know, the waste back into the ocean. I presume now environmentalists would probably have a fit today, but that's the way it was done way back then. Were there other personal items in short supply? Not that I can recall. I I think one of the uh, we seem to we seem to have just about everything we needed. We uh, fresh milk and things like that were uh, impossible to come by. But uh, generally, we could get most everything else. Do you have any humorous stories involving shipboard life? Oh, goodness. I haven't thought about that. <laughs> well, probably if I thought about it long enough, I'd come up with a few. But I can't really uh, give you any examples right now. When you weren't working or standing watch, what pastimes were available? Well, we had, um, as I mentioned before, I was very much into music from the earliest days, and I was a big fan of the big bands of the era. And we used to be able to get a, 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 record, a record player that was part of the ship's uh, equipment, and we would get the latest records from Benny Goodman and Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey and so on. These were the big things in those days. We used our, amused ourselves with that. Before I went into the Navy, uh, I remember my father saying to me that he didn't want to interfere with anything I was going to be doing, but he did want to give me some small advice, and he said, the one thing I want to warn you not to do, no matter what happens, don't get involved in any gambling with anybody, because that can turn pretty nasty. And so I, uh, I did listen to his advice on that one. And I stayed out of the games, but I saw quite a few of them. And they did, like he said, they turned pretty nasty when people started losing. Uh, so I was just as glad to be a spectator and not part of it. Were movies available? We did see movies, yes. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think whether, I don't think they were like every day, but I think during a crossing there might be uh, two movies that we could get to see possibly. Did your ship ever have a swim call? Well, during our uh, days in the Caribbean, uh, we would dive off the ship and, and do a little bit of swimming, swim parties, but uh, not in the North Atlantic. 
What about field day activities? Field day? No, I don't think that's a familiar term to me. Parabetting. No. What about holidays at sea? Well, you know, a holiday like Thanksgiving maybe or, or Christmas or something like that. I think the uh, cooks would make a special attempt to try to do something nice and uh, provide a holiday meal and, if possible, something like turkey and so on. Uh, so I think that that part was good, but I don't think there was any other special uh, celebration of the day. It was mostly to do with the uh, main meal. What about religious services? We uh, didn't have any religious services on board our ship that I can recall. Do you have any stories regarding crossing the equator? No, never crossed it. Or the Prime Meridian or International Dateline? No, it didn't cross that either. Did you visit any interesting ports of call? Well, I think uh, when we were in Bermuda, this, of course, you have to remember I was only 18 years old and I was very impressionable and uh, quite naive, uh, maybe too, but I was very impressed with Key West, Florida when I went there. I was impressed with New Orleans. I was impressed with Bermuda, also with Curacao. I think Curacao was a very quaint place. I still can remember our, the time we spent there. We went into Boston. I found that very interesting. A number of trips to New York. Londonderry was interesting the first time. I didn't think that after that there was much there to go back for. And uh, we did uh, spend some time at Belfast. I thought that was good. I guess I'm just a good traveler. I like to go places and see things. What type of liberty were you given? Well, it was a, it was a port starboard uh, arrangement so that half the ship would have liberty at one time, the other half would have to remain on board for whatever duty. What was your longest stretch at sea before you were given liberty? The longest stretch at sea? Well, probably two weeks maybe at the most because we were we never uh, were on very long runs and we were always in and out a lot because of the nature of the convoys. How did you stay in touch with your family? Well, when the ship was on the convoy run in um, the North Atlantic, it would take us about nine or ten days to go across. We'd be on the other side for maybe three or four days, and then we would return another nine or ten days into New York. And generally speaking, they would put the ship in the Brooklyn Navy Yard for uh, repair work for any sea damage and bring it up to date. So we would be in the Navy Yard for quite a few days, and we would have three or four days off. And being in New York and living in Rochester, it was easy to run over to Grand Central Station and grab the first train for Rochester. So I did get home uh, occasionally, uh, and I think probably much more than, than most uh, fellows did. It was just the way it worked out. How did you feel when you were finally discharged? I was elated, really pleased to, to be out of the Navy and back into civilian life again. How do you look back upon your destroyer escort experiences? Well, it was, uh, there's no two ways about it. It was probably the uh, most important or most uh, dominating thing that has ever happened to me at any time. I, you know, I walked away from the Navy and turned my back on it for a long, long time because I just didn't want to remember any more about the bad times. But uh, as I look back from a distance, I have to admit that it was a very, very um, important time. Uh, well, it was important for the whole world, really, but it certainly was important for me. And it's something that I just can't uh, take out of my mind. Thank you for sharing these experiences with future generations. Is there any other comments you would like to add? Well, I don't really think so. I just, uh, I'm glad I'm here. I am I think I was lucky throughout the whole experience to have survived and to have, uh, you know, made it to this point. 
and uh, I have to thank God for that. <laughs>